Okay, good to be with you all. I um I know Eve is in India right now. I'm excited to hear about her trip and uh, meeting with the Dalai Lama. I believe with the Mind Life Institute, if I'm not mistaken. So that's great. Such good fortune for Eve to have the, that kind of contact with such a great being. Um, so when you know when I it reminds me of a story. I'm going to tell you a story. When I lived in Dharamsala for a year, I was quite shy about getting an audience with His Holiness the Dalai Lama because I knew it was hard to get, and I didn't really have any reason to ask or feel like I had the um, the stature of actually having a one-on-one -on -one audience with him. I actually never dreamed of that, but um, they he would do these. Uh, larger group audiences a couple times a year and more often with the Tibetans because often Tibetans would come into exile from Tibet. They would leave Tibet, uh, risk their life coming over the Himalayas and come down into Dharamsala, which is in the foothills of the Himalayas in Himachal Pradesh, North India. And I always felt like I didn't you know, they're the ones who needed to see him, <laughs> not me. I could see him in his public teachings and empowerments, and that felt like enough for me. And But then towards the end of my stay, when I knew I was coming back home, I signed up for a Westerner public audience. He would do like one day for Westerners, like five days for Tibetans, and he'd spend longer with Tibetans, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, which is good. And... So I waited, I got there early and waited in line for hours and the line was a very interesting kind of display of the different yogis and yoginis, westerners who'd come from afar or who had been living in the mountains around the area, everybody coming out of the woodwork to uh, see His Holiness the Dalai Lama and have just a, you know, a two second moment with him and receive blessing from him. Mm -hmm. And so I think somebody's unmuted, perhaps, if, just in case you don't know. And so um, I remember I was in line, and the line was sort of going up this road that was at a slant, and I was behind a, a Western man. I didn't talk to him. He was very kind of internal and quiet, maybe in his 60s. He was wearing all white robes, maybe with a red stripe. It's, it's, it's the robes he was wearing was a uh, Tibetan uh, yogi, like a ngakpa, which means a mantra, a mantra practitioner, somebody who's a, not a celibate, but that he's a tantric, tantrika Buddhist yogi. And he had his hair tied back, and because I was behind him on this angle of the road, I was taller than him. I could actually look down and see, maybe he also wasn't that tall, uh, but he, I could see the top of his head. And on the crown aperture of his head, he had this protuberance of like scar tissue that looked like had been, like bubbled up and then scarred over, bubbled up and then scarred over, bubbled up and scarred over. It was, you know, noticeable. It was maybe an inch and a half, two inches maybe not two inches, but an inch and a half high or so. And I had just been reading about the POA practice. POA is the practice of uh, learning basically to die well. It's, it's where you learn to eject your consciousness out through the crown aperture of your head and unify your mind with the mind of Amitabha. Usually it's the red Buddha of um, uh, infinite light is his name. He's the Buddha of the Western dimension of the mandala fa uh, mandala structure. He is the, the like the main energy of the uh, land of great bliss, the Buddha pure land of great bliss. The pure land uh, uh, traditions in Japan focus on Amitabha, but also do the Mahayana traditions around the world, including the Tibetans. In any case, Amitabha is this infinite light Buddha that you can practice 
um, in a sense, unifying your mind with at the moment of death so that you don't fall into the illusions, delusions of the bardo experience that are said to be quite strong, like a nightmare, like being buffeted by a you know, Hurricane Ian type thing where you think you can handle it, but when you're in it, you're like, oh my God, why didn't I prepare earlier? Uh, and so POA is that practice of ejecting your consciousness out through the crown of your head. And it's said, I've done these retreats. Now, I haven't had the science because I was just in an introductory retreat over a few days. But through intensive practices, practice over time, when people get adept at it, they actually will have little um, showing, uh, little signs of like a, a blood, a little bit of like an opening of the energy s becomes so forcefully going up and out through the crown of the head that um, you you show signs. And one of them is having those little scars like building up like a top knot, like a, a ushnisha, it's called in Sanskrit, ushnisha. Is that is that one of the thirty-two signs of, of the Buddha? It's one of the like a, a top knot, but in a sense, you're having more of like a scar top knot here. And so that man had it, and I remember going, "Oh my God!" So this really does happen. I mean, who knows? Maybe it was just a birthmark, but that was it. Was right at that uh, fontanelle, you know, when a baby's born and there's a soft spot, you don't want to bump it. It's the, the little area that's still a little tender, even a little soft for us adults, uh, uh, can, um, you know, the, the lamas, when they're testing their students to see if they've had realization with poa, they will take a little piece of straw and see if it can enter into that little hole that's formed at the top of the head. And they won't put it all the way into the brain, but it does the it's said to leave a little bit of a hole. My mom said that that happened to her. So I, I don't know. I haven't tested it yet, but she had a little hole, and the llama was very happy because he could leave it there. The little s straw was sticking up out of her head. <laughs> wow. I don't know. Don't ask me how to explain that scientifically. Now, that's all a preamble to my audience with the Dalai Lama. So I'm in this amazed moment here of like, okay, there's this incredible yogi in front of me. I'm wanting to like talk to him, but I'm shy. So I don't talk to him. I just, I just meditate, you know, feel the presence of these amazing people bef in front and behind me. So eventually the, um, the line starts moving and you kind of go into the compound of His Holiness the Dalai Lama around this kind of circular driveway that rounds the front of his home. And he's standing at the front doorstep of his home with a couple steps. So he's standing up on a step and we're all filing by in front of him. So I can see other people doing that. And everybody's saying, Oh, Mani Padme Hung and trying to keep pure mind so that the blessings really, you feel the blessings and you don't miss the moment because you can see it's pretty fast. Everybody's going pretty fast. And uh, it's finally my turn. He has these monks around him who are helping sh um, move people forward in the line. I get pushed right up in front of him. And he looks at me. He gives me a, a red cord, a blessed red cord. And he says a prayer into it. Oh, man, put me home. And then he gives it to me and he says, Tashi Dele, in his deep voice. Tashi Dele. And his voice was like nectar pouring into my body. I really did. I did feel the blessings of the Dalai Lama, and that's all I needed. That's all I needed. I was like, oh, tush, Tashi Dele. I could say that, you know, hello, thank you, Tujiche. And, um, and then I was pushed off, you know, but that was, that was such a magical moment in my life. And the interesting thing about that was that afternoon, I was having an early dinner with a friend of mine who also had an odd, had, had stood in the line, and we were talking about it. We were all excited. The day was filled with so much magic. And we come out of this little Tibetan restaurant, and the sun is setting. It's getting dark. And we look up, and Hale Bop is in the sky. And we could see it. Did 
how many people saw hail about back in the 90s? Did you see it with your own eyes? And it was huge, right? It was like a big fat meteor with a big fat tail, right? Did, you, you know what I, so we walked down, we're like, oh my God, <laughs> it was quite a sight to see. And there were other little blessings like colorful rainbow birds that I'd never seen before chirping that morning, right? As I was going on my way to see, uh, stand in line for the audience. And magic happens around holy people. You know, magic happens. I mean, we can't explain it, but it just does. So that is my audience with the Dalai Lama story that I was thinking about today as I was texting with Eve saying, where did you get to in the book? And sorry to bother you. I know it's 3 a.m. <laughs> and she's like, yeah, I'm up at 3 a.m. I'll tell you. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> so I don't know. Hopefully she's having a good time. Isn't that, that's, I don't know if that was story was good for you, but it's fun for me to share that because, you know, I was 23, 24. I was so young and impressionable and um, maybe 15 years ago, I had the good fortune of having a hug from Ama and it was amazing and wonderful, but I didn't feel it the way that I was hoping to. And I didn't feel it the way that I felt the Dalai Lama and I'm kind of embarrassed to say that you know I was thinking I'm really going to feel the hug from mom I'm going to just people describe it like basking in the ocean of consciousness or all your your fear is purified and I just I loved her and I would love to feel it but sometimes our karma is stronger with some people and not as strong with others and that's okay and maybe it's also about timing and um, but I was actually writing about Ama today because she is my 15th Tara, and so I was remembering my little hug with Ama too in Castro Valley. How many people have gotten hugged by Ama, Ama G? No? No? Buddhists? <laughs> come on, Buddhists! <laughs> no, hopefully she'll come around uh, again. You know, I know she's not traveling as much, but uh, she's worth the effort if she comes to her s beautiful uh, ashram in Castro Valley again. So, yeah, they say that her hug is like Amrita. It's a purifying nectar, and she's able to purify or see into people and what they need, and she gives them just the right dose, not too much, not too little. And and uh, I was hearing some stories about her that were quite phenomenal. So she is my 15th Tara, real life Tara. Um, the 15th Tara is Tara Prashanti. She is the great blissful goddess. And her symbol is an anointing vase that's overflowing with healing nectar. And so we can imagine her nectar flowing into us and purifying us of illness, of negativity, of obstacles. And it was a suitable chapter to be writing about today because it's also the theme of our meditation today is we'll do a healing meditation. And we'll feel that the, the visualization that is often employed with healing meditations or um, like purification practices are either of light, which I think you did with Eve last week, or like nectar flowing into you and through your body. So we'll get to experience that in a moment. So does that sound good? Shall we just go ahead and let's, uh, let's go ahead and, and meditate. Denise says we can watch Eve's meeting on the Dalai Lama's website, right? I saw part of the first part last night, I think. Oh, that's so cool. I didn't even know that. She didn't tell me that. But she must have told you last week. So it's on his website, the Dalai Lama. Would it, would it just be maybe DalaiLama.com or org or something like that, right? So thank you. If anybody has that link, go ahead and post it in the chat for all of us to, to, to see. Any questions or comments before we sit? You guys doing well? Good to see people in the room there and SF. Yeah, good. I see a heart. 
I see some old familiar faces, Jane and Joy. Oh my gosh, I haven't seen you guys in ages. Is this your first time back? One of them, two or three. That's great. And Catherine, good to see you all. Yeah. Okay, my friends, let's go ahead and shift gears and get into a comfortable meditative space. Cozy, warm. Well, okay, good. You're okay, not good that your wife has COVID, but at least you don't have it as yet. And yeah, that's why you're not on site. Thank you for being careful. We all appreciate that. And I hope your wife has a not too rough of a time of it and that she recovers swiftly and that you stay healthy as well. Yeah. So this will be a good, maybe you could visualize her being healed as well in this uh, visualization and we extend the, these healing prayers to, to all beings, of course. Okay. So we'll start with some shamatha, and then I'll shift gears into a healing visualization meditation for the last half, okay? So allow the eyes to close. Take some deep breaths. And start to Release any tension that you're holding in your body. You may notice the shoulders softening, getting a little more heavy. And while the shoulder blades release down the back, the chest lifts a little, it's buoyant but soft and open. Sometimes the chin comes forward and up a bit, so gently draw it back towards the center of the throat, but without pinching or forcing anything. Just feel the space opening at the base of the skull. And with your next breath, even see if you can feel like you're breathing into the skull, the back of the skull, the base, the brainstem. Feel that expand a bit and exhale, release tension or holding from the skull, from the base of the skull, the neck. You could even feel it melting or draining down along the back like honey. With each out breath, feel this downward flow of tension <coughs> melting down to the earth. Tension melting from the face, the jaw, the root of the tongue. Between the shoulder blades, Feel the breath filling the lungs, the rib cage expanding as you inhale. Releasing as you exhale. Feel the breath in the diaphragm and descending down to the belly. Feel the belt line soft. The kidneys released down a bit towards the sits bones. Feel the hips, the pelvic floor, the sacrum soft, trusting of the seat beneath you. The thighs, the knees, the lower legs and feet all in a comfortable position to hold with relative ease and stillness as much as possible for the duration of the sit. Do about 35, 40 minutes tonight.
Feel the arms relaxed. If you wish, simply resting the palms face down on the thighs. Notice if the thumbs or the fingers are tight. Soften the fingers, the palms. And arouse the heartfelt motivation. Just a simple heart's breath, a heart prayer. Your aspiration for your life and your practice. And releasing that and just letting it expand through your body and out into space. And become aware of the breath in the body. And just feel this simple quality of presence in the moment with your breath in your body. This first moment of just coming home to what's true, what's here now. What's the internal atmosphere? You might even put your hand on your heart and say, I'm here with you. I see you. And having this gentle approach with yourself with your mind, with your emotions, your subtle body, the energy and the physical body. Sometimes we've had a hard day and we need to have just a quality of space and allowance of whatever is here to be here before we start trying to fix or impose a technique. It's aligning with what's true. It helps to open the subtle body the channels open. The breath deepens. And the energy that's often stuck up in the head can get more diffuse and drop into the heart, drop into the belly, all the way to the soles of the feet. So that you become aware of your global field, the whole field of sensations from the soles of the feet, the crown of the head, periphery of the skin, You wish, release the hand from the heart, bring it back to the lap. And now, let's practice a quality of breath awareness infused by the Buddha's teachings found in the Satipatthana Sutta of Mindfulness of Breathing where he offers some gatis, some phrases that help the mind rest in the moment. And we'll start with one simply attending to the whole body, I breathe in. Attending to the whole body, I breathe out. Internally saying this to yourself as, a, as an anchor for the mind 
to then actually do that. Attending to the body, I breathe in. Attending to the body, I breathe out. And really feel that quality of awareness pervading the entire body as much as possible. Releasing distracting thoughts and attractive shiny things. For now, just come back to the breath and the simple phrase internally, attending to the whole body, I breathe in, attending to the whole body, I breathe out. Quality of relaxation suffusing you. If you wish, you can shorten the phrase to something simple like Attending whole body in, attending whole body out. Thus one trains. You may notice sensations of warmth or coolness, movement or stuckness. Without fixing, just noticing, attending to the whole body. Breathe in, attending the whole body. Breathe out. Release distraction, 
as soon as you notice and come back to the in and the outflow of the natural breath unforced attending to the whole body I breathe in attending to the whole body I breathe out And the next gati the Buddha offers is soothing the field of the body. I breathe in, soothing the field of the body. I breathe out. Soothing the field of the body. I breathe in, soothing the field of the body. I breathe out. This quality of just a gentle, like a breeze, sweeping through the body, soothing any tension or constriction, soothing the body-mind with the massage effect of the breath flowing in and out of the body. Releasing distraction with the exhalation. Stay in the moment with the gati internally. Even simplify something like soothing field, breathe in. Soothing field, breathe out. Just make it personal and stay. Enjoy the soothing effect of the relaxed yet focused mind.
soothing the field of the body. I breathe in, soothing the field of the body. I breathe out, thus one trains. And then gently release the phrase and let the mindfulness of breathing and the gati fade into the background. And shifting into the next phase of practice, taking the mind itself as the object, the anchor. Just relax and open into this feeling of settling the mind in its natural state being aware of the space within which thoughts and feelings arise and pass. It's like an opening of the aperture a bit, a loosening of the focus, but without getting spaced out. Spacious, not spacey. You can leave the eyes closed or gently open them if you wish. The main point is to feel that quality of simply being aware of that space of the mind without grasping or following after thoughts and fantasies, regrets. Release, drop it, or cut them loose into that spaciousness and stay with this quality of presence wakefulness.
And if the eyes are opened, let them gently close again. And now we're shifting into the last phase of our practice of receiving healing blessings meditation. So now bring into the space of the mind's eye either a deep blue light or the image of the Buddha, the medicine Buddha, this deep, beautiful, almost a midnight blue. This midnight blue is its almost like a blue-black, but a little more blue. The color is tingsel in Tibetan. It's a symbol of the absolute nature of mind. It's like the innermost depth of consciousness. And Buddha, the medicine Buddha, is an embodiment of that ultimate source of healing. So you can imagine, if you know what the medicine Buddha looks like, or you can just imagine Buddha as blue, feel free to do that. Or even just feeling that quality of blue, luminous depth, tingsel light around you. And feel this presence of the healing energy, of the healing Buddha. And then you may even, if you are imagining figure, you can imagine the, the main central Buddha figure of the blue medicine Buddhas surrounded by an infinite number of smaller medicine Buddhas filling all of space like a kaleidoscope. And feel that these Buddhas or this energy of blue light is surrounding you, gazing upon you with love, wisdom, and healing power. And you may even feel or think that your mind and your body are blossoming and opening with the energy of devotion devotional prayer, opening to this potential to receive the healing blessings, this blissful heat and warmth of devotion opening in your heart and in your body. Could just even be a tingle or an inkling. Just feel like a lotus blossom blooming towards the light Feel your heart opening and blooming towards the light of the healing energy of healing Buddha. This devotional feeling or potential within you has a way of opening us, making us a, a vessel to receive the blessing of the healing Buddhas. and feel that you're turning towards this energy invokes their compassion, this powerful sense of wisdom, this infinite source of healing. And as a result, they send you rainbow light, even if it's just a sense of light coming from the depths of space, or the Buddhas themselves, a spiraling, rainbow, five-colored light, wisdom light, flowing from space, from them, into you. Shining upon you. And feel that these beams of light are like a stream of healing nectar of Amrita. They are beams of love, of wisdom, and power that the healing Buddhas are sending to you as their blessings. So feel that rainbow light 
spiraling around and within you, entering into every cell of your skin, of your body, And feel that these beams of light are not just beautiful, pure forms of light, but they are the light of heat, of bliss, healing, and power, energy. They're not inanimate beams of light. Their manifestation of the love and the wisdom of these awakened beings in the form of blessing light. And feel that the shower of blessing light is touching the skin of your body, front and back, and from the top of your head and to the soles of your feet. Feel the blessing energies. You may even feel that heat and that bliss, the blissful heat of the blessing light flowing within you. And now with your mind's eye, look inside your body and sense that your body is at present totally dark inside. And see and feel that this darkness is just an expression of various blocks or problems you might have. This darkness is your mentality of tightness, rigidity, or grasping, or maybe afflictive emotions, confusion, greed, hatred, jealousy, or maybe this feeling of sadness, anxiety, or insecurity, or pain, loneliness. The darkness is the sickness and the disease, perhaps, in your body, the impurities of your energy. And see and feel that this darkness of your body is the problems that you want to heal. So briefly feel the sensation of your problems in this darkness. And then think and feel that the beams of bright light are entering your body through every pore. And your body is filled with a flow of blessing light. Your whole body, from the top of your head to the soles of your feet, is filled with the blessing rainbow light. And see this amazing brightness of the blessing light that has totally filled your body. As your body is filled with the blessing light, feel also that your body is filled with powerful heat and bliss. This blissful heat. And feel that blessing energies have filled every cell of your body. They have filled every corner of every cell.
think and believe that the blessing powers of the healing Buddhas in the form of bright light and powerful energy have entirely filled your body. All the darkness of your life is dispelled from your body completely without leaving even a trace as if thousands of suns had arisen inside your body. All your problems in the form of darkness have vanished completely. And you may even feel that this blessing light, the blissful heat, they're melting the ice-like coldness or hardness that you may have within you, maybe your rigid mind, the tension in the body melting into a soft, peaceful and warm feeling. The blessing energies melt all coldness into a flowing, healing, warm stream that washes away all the frigidities of pain and sadness, numbness, and feel that warm, healing stream of blissful energy flowing through your body. And then finally, enjoy the feeling of peace and joy and freedom from all discomfort, problems. Just feel a natural joyful peace arising within you. Even if it's for a moment, what would that feel like? And then relax and open awareness of the peace and joy in silence, free of grasping, or thinking about it, just allow yourself to rest in the simple presence, the afterglow of the meditation.
if you wish, by closing, we can bring our palms together in prayer at our heart and make a personal prayer of dedication, positive energy, dedicated for the benefit of all beings everywhere. And may the energy of the healing Buddhas permeate all of space and bring that healing blessing to all those in need. People, animals, insects, the world. May it be so. Thank you. So any questions or comments right out of the experience, any, anything arise that you'd like to mention or ask about? You can chat it in or unmute maybe. People in the room also. So, okay, I'm not hearing anything. Let me know if, if you change your mind. <laughs> um, Denise, what was the opening of the base of the skull? <laughs> yeah. Um, that's the, one of my favorite things to do. Um, you know, the occiput is that top vertebrae that this the skull sits on and with gravity and tension postural things we can kind of get tight there or stuck and then the blood flow doesn't flow well uh, cerebral spinal fluid if you've ever had craniosacral a part of that is about allowing the the rhythm of the craniosacral fluid that pulses through the spinal cord to f be more free-flowing and a practitioner will just gently hold sometimes that part of the base of the skull so that that fluid and that movement can open um, they communicate the sacrum the sacrum in a sense is like a similar shape as the base of the skull too they're like little shallow bowls right so you know if the spine is is fluid and strong of course but also not um, rigid then you know we feel younger we feel better we have better circulation and so um, I like to bring that element into my meditation because it helps me a lot to breathe into that space to open it and really often what needs to what can help is just taking a chin that might normally be up because that shortens the space. I don't know if you can see me, but you know, if I'm looking up, it's tighter. But if I bring my chin down, it creates more space. <laughs> I don't, I can't tell if you can see what I'm doing. Um, cause I can't see the screen, but do you see what I mean? You could try it. Put your chin up and it kind of condenses and then bring the chin back. When I say towards the center of the throat, what that does is it elongates the back of the neck. It helps the shoulders to relax down. And so we can find that natural plumb line through the spinal column and have more ease holding this big, heavy bowling ball up. It's too heavy. What's going on? <laughs> Design flaw. So... I hope that's helpful and you know honestly for me I've tapped into this a little bit in more um, concentrated practice sessions like on retreat I remember remember 
some of you might have been in class when I had come out of my three weeks at Taramandala. I was talking a lot about that place. Because that brainstem area for me in the meditation, I'm not a neuroscientist, okay? I, I don't, I'm not that Dharma teacher. So maybe Eve can talk more to that or somebody else. But I could feel in my own experience that this, the, the fear of the, the ego death, that kind of final threshold before you let go and you enter into the blissful abyss. Remember that? We talk about the, the bliss is a bit, the abyss is bliss. Well, right before you step off the cliff into the abyss, you're terrified. I mean, I would think. I've never done that, but I, I used to be a rock climber. I know what it's like to go over the edge and rappel down. It's scary. But then as you get going, you're like, oh, I'm actually okay. Okay, so that step, that the tightness of the ego, of separation, of duality, often is coiled up in that base of the spine. The base of the, well, base of the spine. Kundalini is definitely coiled up at the base of the spine. But there's also a coiling or a tightening or a closing of the door of that occiput brainstem area. So if you can soften that, breathe into it, open it, then the releasing happens, the natural releasing into presence. And then you can step off that cliff and realize that the abyss is bliss and it's not scary. Excuse me, um, Lopan Chandra, Bill raised his hand and then Claudia did. Yeah, I know. I'm just going on oh. and on with my answer. And I want to just say one more thing, <laughs> which is um, we. I was at Esalen last week and one of the students, I was talking about the abyss is bliss and one of the students is like, the abyss. <laughs> so she coined a new word. I think it's really clever. And um, it's called the abyss. And that's what we're going for in these meditations. So, okay, Bill and Claudia. I just wanted to um, thank you, Chandra, for uh, including the Satipatthana Sutta instructions mm -hmm. in your meditation. It's um, <clears throat> the foundational vehicle is where I come from. And um, I, I, most of my training um, is there. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also thank you for the breadth of where you went with that, the three different phases and, uh, you know, the posture. And it you can really feel it when when you get that lined up properly. Yeah. And um, that's real important, too. And so uh, mm -hmm. after a long day, I feel better <laughs> just because mostly my body is more relaxed. You know, it's just like, gosh, sometimes I carry around so much tension with just, you know, the, 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 the rush and hubbub of getting through this modern world and all the things that we have to do. And um, I'm just really glad and thankful that I got a chance to relax. I just need a little help yes. <laughs> sometimes. And so thank you. Yes, absolutely. We need community. We need to be reminded. Thanks for sharing, Bill. Yeah, I love the foundational vehicles. And somebody's asking what that is. Maybe I'll just say while we're on it, and then I'll, then I'll have Claudia. I'd love to hear your question or comment. The first phrase, and I can type them out maybe while, before we get off the phone, but the first is uh, attending to the whole body I breathe in. Attending to the whole body. I breathe out, or I shall breathe out. Um, I have a PDF that I made for the retreat I did last week that has those. Maybe I can also share that, but that's a simple phrase. You can even modify it, like I said, but the ba bare bones are attending to the whole body, I shall breathe in. Attending to the whole body, I shall breathe out. Thus one trains. So then you're saying that internally. Then when you feel ready to move to the next one, you if you want to, you can do the second one, is soothing the field of the body, I shall breathe in. Soothing the field of the body, I shall breathe out. Thus one trains. And there are other ones that lead it up to that, but those are really great. The other ones that are simple, like breathing in, 
breathing out, you know, breathing in mindfully, breathing out mindfully, breathing in long, I'm mindful, I breathe in long, breathing out long, I'm mindful, I breathe out long, or breathing in short, I'm mindful, I breathe in short, breathing out short, I'm mindful, I breathe out short. It's just getting really granular, really simple, exquisitely beautiful and simple, simple internal phrases to help you be here now, you know. It's giving the mind something to do rather than... Okay, Claudia. Hi, Chandra. Thank you so much. Hi. It was uh, truly very relaxing as well. And uh, you kind of partially answered my question because I wanted to know the steps through which you guided us Uh okay to try to you know replicate uh on my own so yeah yeah. so yeah good let's let's do that let's review because these are these are important points and they can help you feel more freedom to then modify right when you need to so we start with the body just coming home to the body taking some relaxing breaths to get here and then bodhicitta your own personal prayer if you want you can take the bodhicitta mudra two middle fingers up the rest folded that's the single pointed intention mudra i don't always teach that but you know you've got it in your back pocket if you want to pull it out during bodhicitta and the single pointed intention is the aspiration to awaken for the benefit of all beings that's what we're beaming up scotty and and then i like to encourage myself and you to just be with yourself what's here now and that's a really important first step before you start getting into fixing (laughs) so just be with yourself what's here oh i'm feeling sad today or i've had a tough day <clears throat> or I'm actually doing really well today, or whatever, just coming home to what's true right now. Spend as long there as you want. And then we did the first phrase, attending to the whole body. Breathe in, attending to the whole body. Breathe out. We spent 10 minutes with that. Then we did 10 minutes with soothing the field of the body. I breathe in, soothing the field of the body. I breathe out. But it's up to you. But just so you know, that's about what we did. And then we did almost 10 minutes of settling the mind in its natural state, where you sort of open the aperture and you're shifting from the breath and the phrase, which is called a gati. You're shifting from that being your anchor to the domain of the mind being your anchor. So it's a bit more open. Did you feel that? It's kind of a bit more relaxed, maybe, maybe relaxing, maybe not. And then we did that for a while, almost 10 minutes. And then I brought you around to the healing, receiving the healing energy meditation that is on page 150, I believe. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. But that's page 149 to 150. It's a medicine Buddha practice that he mentioned in the third chapter that we were reading, or fourth chapter, the third chapter that we're on this week. So I thought I would guide that meditation. For those of you who read the chapter about his, his student, Harry, who really benefited from that healing meditation, he has quite a phenomenal story in the book in chapter three. So that's why I took us all the way to that meditation tonight, because I wanted you to feel that. And then we did it, and then and then, it's in the meditation actually. The healing meditation is to then just rest, in openness, spacious, and then dedicate at the end. So we always start with, for the most part, bodhicitta, end with dedication at the end. And then the middle is always some sort of mindfulness practice, whether it's breath, the mind, mantra, visualization always infusing the practice with mindful awareness. Okay, I see that there was a hand Thank raised you. in the room. You're welcome. Yeah. And then, and yeah, so let's go there. And then Jane and Rose. 
So Santa Far San Francisco Dharma Collective. Hi, uh, I was wondering about. I just turned it on. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah. Hi. Who, I was wondering about name? the word. Uh, my name is Ben. Hi Ben. Uh, hi. I was wondering about the word field. Yeah. Because it has a lot of interpretations, and I was curious. Mm. Uh, what interpretation would be closest to whichever language it's translated from and this could be a separate answer mm -hmm. what interpretation maybe you were thinking of yeah the way my teacher who taught it to me interprets that is i don't have the poly the original poly i'm not a poly or sanskrit scholar per se i do tibetan translate tibetan and so i'd have to see the tibetan here how Alan Wallace translated field. Usually he would translate field as yule. It depends. It's probably like the, the, the field or the domain of the body. Yule is the Tibetan for that. Um, but field can also be shing, which means like land. So it depends. It's probably more yule. And um, the way Alan explains it, maybe I wasn't overt in this guided meditation, so I apologize about that. But field is the whole field of tactile sensations okay so that means really from head to toe out to the periphery of your skin so everything on and within you so the field of the body and so being aware of it but then the it's interesting this quality of soothing it so we go from just attending to it the body the entire body to then actually sort of doing something with it which is you know, it, we do do that in some forms of mindfulness practice, right? But uh, explicitly, the Buddha says soothing this field of tactile sensations in the body. Breathe in, soothing the field of the body, breathe out. So that's how I've learned it, and that's how I would also then interpret it. Does that answer your question, Ben? Yes, thank you. Great. We could go quantum field, maybe. <laughs> okay, Jane. Oh, that was marvelous. Thank you so much. Um, lately, my uh, my life has been a little tumultuous emotionally, and it's been taking all of my resources to kind of keep myself from becoming engaged hysterically. So this was really great opportunity to uh, go some, to, some, to another place. Good. And um, it was great until I got to the, the, the part where you let your mind, you kind of open up to your mind. <laughs> and then the monkeys, the flying monkeys came in. <laughs> <laughs> and it kind of got a little chaotic in there. And I, I found myself just kind of re-traumatized a little bit by, you know, all the things that I'm trying to, you know, kind of yeah. temporarily keep a b at bay right. so that I shift it and be here. Um, fortunately, when you went into the state of going with the blue Buddha, that kind of seemed to, to help me come back. But I'm wondering in the midst of all that, do I just let it all kind of happen and just sit with it? Or do I try to mm -hmm. put it someplace? Or it, I mean, is there there's some kind of at, uh, action I should take within that meditation or just be with it, which can often derail me in a certain sense. Yeah, great, great question. I My quick answer would be it depends, but then of course I'm gonna qualify that. There are times when we have more capacity to just be with the, the flying monkeys and other times when we don't. So. It's sounding like for you, maybe less so right now because it's a challenging time. Um, so I would say like if, if I was just guiding you one on one, I would have kept you longer with the pieces that were working for you right now. You know, just the soothing, maybe soothing the field of the body, soothing the field of the body. Uh, let you stay with that longer, you know, do a whole week with just that phrase. I mean, that's how I've done this on retreat where you just cook with it. You don't have to touch everyone for every sit. So that's also good for the whole group to know. You know, you could just choose one of those things and do the whole, do it for an hour every day for a month or more, you, your life. But um, 
So I would say that if the one of those earlier phrases or both of those earlier phrases were working for you in terms of the condition that you're in right now, how you're feeling, then that's okay. And sometimes meditation can re-traumatize, you know. So it's it's good to be aware of that and to know that that's actually a thing. And a lot of meditation teachers might not talk about that very much. So we might think we're going nuts because we're feeling spun out or even bigger adrenaline rush than we had sitting before we sat down. So it's good to know what to do when that happens. Sometimes it's good to just pause the session and go out for a walk, kind of jog it off or walk it off, or lie down and have a good cry, <laughs> you know? Um, or or do the healing Buddha meditation. You know, it's sounding like when the mind is active, for a lot of us, it's nice to give the mind something to do that's more constructive, more healing. And so the visualization worked for you or the phrase worked for you. So I would say, Jane, just keep cooking with, with those techniques. And then the settling the mind in its natural state can come later when you're ready. It's all about arriving well, right? Not mm -hmm. squeezing into it, but just make, setting mm -hmm. up the conditions so that you just slide into home base in a real smooth, nice way. Yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to continue to, to stay with, I think, the, uh, the soothing part Good. for a little bit longer until I feel ready. Yeah, light a candle, come back to that phrase, just know you've got that place of refuge in you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks. Yeah. We'll Appreciate it. Yeah. Welcome. Absolutely. Okay, Rose, and then Sylvia. Um, I wasn't able to really get into the relaxation that much because I have a, um, a pain that is just dominating. Mm. And um, so that was throbbing. <laughs> and the rest of my body, I could feel that this central place that's hurting just uh, we got a little better with the meditation, but it was still dominating. And, you know, that's something that's very familiar, that I, that's kind of chronic. So I know pretty much how to deal with it. But, um, uh, I mean, I have ways that I cope with it. Mm -hmm. um, but um, the interest, I just wanted to mention that I... Um, so other times, you know, that's not bothering me, but it did, it was bothering me tonight. Anyhow, uh, the image of the blue uh, medicine Buddha was really, um, I felt a lot closer to that image, um, the way that you were talking about that. Um, and I was able to visualize it the blue buddha and i just felt like i got a closer sense of of that mm. um and also having all the little blue buddhas in space <laughs> that was really interesting also um so i'm wondering um and i've seen like a christian image of angels especially little baby angels you know children angels um there's very um ancient paintings in like old churches uh, old church where these all these little tiny angels that, that are just you know <laughs> so i was wondering if there was a connection or some sort of similarity and what happens in the mind to create those kind of images? Um, it's just kind of a hallucination or, you know, when, um, you know, that it happens, you know, in the Tibetan tradition, that image or in the Christian tradition. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, I'm kind of rambling, but... Um, yeah, we only have a couple minutes and we have other people who want to ask the questions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but that's, thank you for sharing that. And I want to just first encourage you to 
feel free to take a position that doesn't bring up that pain. You know, I, I know what it is to live with chronic pain and I, I mm. want you to be careful um, especially if it's a nerve pain or a pain that can exacerbate. It's a nerve pain. Yeah, don't push through the nerve pain. Uh, move your body. Lie down. Do supine position. That's a viable position that the Buddha taught as a position for meditation. If that helps you, or lying on your side or your back or in a recliner chair, whatever you need to do to be comfortable, do it. You say you know how, so I, I trust that you do. Um, find a way you can do that without falling asleep, whatever you do. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I think that these images are, in a sense, archetypal. I'm not um, that schooled in, in Christian mysticism or iconography, uh, but certainly in, in many of the Buddhist uh, visualizations, and uh, as well as Hindu too, that I'm familiar with, sometimes that infinite space of filled with wisdom beings is a very common visualization that can bring a lot of healing and a feeling of like I'm not alone and oh there are these angels that are in you know a more subtle dimension that are benevolent that have my back that care and that actually are infinite resources for healing I just need to open my heart to them mm. so there is something to that I'm glad you connected with the Bo medicine Buddha too yeah, thank you. Okay, Sylvia. Gina. Gina. Hi. Gina, you Hi. need to put both your names there so I can remember. Yes, yes, sorry. <laughs> yeah, 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 I forgot. That's okay, to... that's okay. You don't have to. Um, there's two of the questions that I wanted to ask you. Um, for me, the soothing, the soothing of the field seems so esoteric. I just, I, yeah, I couldn't... Oh. For some reason, yeah, yeah, that's one question. The other question was about how the blue became the rainbow light. <laughs> Good, okay. Yeah, it, it, from, it's strange because I, I also have that image. I'm not Christian, but I, when you talked about the rainbow, I remembered the, that image of Christ with all the rays, the rainbow of rays out mm -hmm. of his heart. Uh, that's there in in Mexico. We have that kind of image all the time with with oh, Christ, yeah. and yeah, it, it it brought that back to me. But I wanted to ask about those two things, please. Okay. Uh, the first, what was the first question? Oh, the, the soothing the field of the body felt very esoteric. Yeah, maybe I I just needed to explain it more. Really, what it is is soothing the whole uh, area of the body. You know, so if there's tension in the heart or the back or the jaw, soothe it soften it soothe soften it. yeah soften soothe what what about like what about mind. not not softening or not not using that word softening or or relaxing but for example when when you're ill or like i had cancer yeah. i have um what kind of soothing can you do yeah you know like you would have a child where you'd pet them or like a kitty cat you know like you know it's like you're you're calming, you know, it's like you're, there are parts of you that feel frazzled or afraid or mm -hmm. anxious somehow, whatever, sometimes putting pressure can help soothe, like you would, mm -hmm. you know, how people like to sleep with a weighted blanket. In Ayurveda, they talk about putting oil, warm oil mm -hmm. on the body and the skin or weight, somebody hugging you or holding you that soothes you. So whatever helps you feel that quality of of mm -hmm. like coming into a place of calm uh however i don't know if there's a better word you know in spanish that would resonate more with you or you can find that um and then the other thing yeah okay so this is you know we're three minutes over the hour and this is a very interesting question about the rainbow because it does mean something so the depth blue, I'm, I explained that that means the nature of mind, that infinite kind of mm -hmm. Akashic field or the emptiness, fullness, the empty fullness, consciousness, right? That's what the ting cell, that deep, deep blue, midnight mm -hmm. blue represents that the Buddha, medicine Buddha has. But then the rainbow color is an enactment of all the, they're mm -hmm. called the trinle or the enlightened activities of the Buddhas. Because you have the, the, the blue is about, Vajra is about pacifying, the, 
the gold is about enriching, like the earth. And then the, the, um, the green is about subduing any negativity, kind of another version of pacifying, but a little different, sometimes a little more forceful. And then the, um, the, the white is of, of the kind of an, a, a completion or a manifestation of all those other four activities. So it's really a big, spacious um, answer. Uh, that's a concise answer to a spacious topic, which is very interesting in terms of Buddhist Tantra, what the rainbow actually means. The rainbow represents the five wisdoms. It represents the five elements, the five energies, the five lights. So it's deep, 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 beautiful teachings that we can explore maybe more as we do more rainbow visualization. Sometimes you can focus on one color. Like if you want to just focus on pacifying, you do the blue. Or, um, or subduing, you do the green. Or, oh, I forgot to do the, the red is, uh, Padma is about magnetizing all that's beneficial. Mm -hmm. So if you like that, then you'd do more red visualization. So you'd pray to more red deities to bring more Padma magnetizing energy in your life. So the rainbow is like, I've got all my bases covered. <laughs> Whatever <laughs> beings need, <laughs> rainbow. <laughs> all the colors of the rainbow are enacting all of those enlightened activities for healing, for my healing, for the world's healing. So read my book and you'll learn all about it <laughs> as we talk about those five lights, five colors, because Tara visualization has a lot of that heart, the rainbow coming from the heart of Tara. And then when you're her, you, you imagine rainbow coming from your heart, your body. So there's some echoes there with, the, with Christianity. That's interesting. Okay, everybody. I hope that was enriching for you. I hope you felt the rainbow. I'm doing a mudra that we used to do, that we do all the time, and it's called the pekor. <laughs> it's lotus circle. Rainbow light whew, to all of you. Um, I will see you. I don't. I can't remember who's teaching next week. It's either Eve or me. So we'll see you next week. I hope. Enjoy the book if you haven't gotten it. Boundless Healing by Tolku Tundup. It has interesting teachings and then lots of guided healing meditations. Thank you. Be well. Thank you, Chen. Feel free to unmute and say goodbye if you want to. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. So much. It's lovely. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.